Congrats on making it to chapter two, starting with section 2.1 for this new chapter. Complex numbers, which is a topic that you have most likely seen in algebra two, coming back again, where here we will be adding and subtracting complex numbers. This is really easy. Multiplying complex numbers takes a little bit of time. We won't see dividing because I'm skipping it and it gets a little tricky. If you're curious about it, let me know, but I'm gonna skip it. Perform operations with square roots of negative numbers. Yeah, we got that. And eventually solving quadratic equations with complex imaginary solutions seen here. To get you back into the swing of things, working with complex numbers, I've included this sheet here. The main idea I think to take away is that to say that we have t some type of solution for problems like x squared plus one equals zero. If you try to solve problems like this, whether you use factoring and then zero product property, you kind of get stuck because the only thing you can end up doing is really isolating x squared and saying that it's equal to negative one. But when you start to check your calculator for something like this, it'll say something like does not exist or it's not real. And so to work around this, this idea came into progress years forever ago when math was still being developed, the idea that there could be some type of answer. So instead of just saying does not exist, your calculator has been saying this forever, the idea of an imaginary number was introduced where i, the imaginary number, is equal to the square root of negative 1. So for a problem like this, we could say that x equals plus or minus the square root of negative 1. So really plus or minus i would be a salvageable answer. We see that sometimes these terms are squared or put to the third power and those outcomes are different. And it really just keeps working around the idea that i squared would have to be equal to negative one and that i is equal to the square root of negative one. So we see that we can add these, we can combine like terms with these. And we'll start first with performing what's going on here. So we have a few options with how we can do this. So we have a radical outside parentheses where inside we have two radicals that are being subtracted. So I think the best movement here would be to FOIL. So if we FOIL in this first product, we have the product of square root of negative six and square root of negative three getting us here. We're then deducting the product um, square root of negative six and two, so negative six times two. If we take this product further, this is going to give us the square root of positive 18, which is fine, nothing to change there. But when we take this further, this is going to be the square root of negative 12. So we see the first issue here where we now have a square root for a negative number. What's cool is that we can factor that out pretty quickly and just say that this is i root 12 where we still have root 18. And so most of the work is pretty much done. If we wanted to say this was the final answer, we could, but a lot of the problems here are gonna ask you to keep simplifying in the sense that square root of 18 could be broken down because we have a factor of 18 that's a perfect square. Can you think of that number? You should be saying nine. So you can rewrite this as nine times two. Square root of nine, you know that's just three root two. You're then deducting i. And how about for 12? Is there a factor there that's a perfect square? You should be saying four or three. So you can factor out that two and say that you're deducting two i root three. So this actually, as far as the final simplified version, would be something to the effect of 3 root 2 minus 2i root 3. And that's considered the most simplified way to write that. We see for the next problem that we have a bit of subtracting and adding. So I'm going to first focus on the constants that I have. So terms without i, I think that's the easiest place to start because we have six, we have this three in parentheses, we then have this four. So if we just focus on our constants, 
we have six. We're then taking away three. We're then adding on four. This is gonna get us seven. And so now if we focus on the imaginary numbers, so the I terms, I'll underline this in red. So we have this two I and negative five I, keeping in mind that this has this negative in parentheses here. So we should really be treating this as negative two I and then deducting five I, which would just get us negative seven I, which is fine. So since we've focused on our constants, we focused on our I terms, we can bring these all together collectively saying that our term is gonna be seven as a constant minus seven I. That would be the most simplified form for this. It's pretty easy. Combining terms of I isn't too tricky. We see when we are squaring or multiply these, this can take a little bit of time, but we can definitely utilize foiling and box method and also utilize that still the square root of negative one is gonna be i and also that i squared is gonna be considered negative one. So we'll start first on three minus i. So if I use foiling for that or box method, I'll use box method for this. So we have this set up, keeping in mind that we're multiplying in each box. So three times three is gonna be nine. Three times negative i is negative three i. Negative three i once again. Negative i times negative i gets us positive i squared, which we can then rewrite to negative one. So as far as the terms that we can combine here, we need to definitely focus on our negative three i and negative three i. So negative six i, but if we focus on our constants for this nine and this negative one, we should say that this is eight. So this is actually the simplified version of that. If we take this further, we're then deducting one plus i being squared. So if we have one plus i, one plus i, filling in everything, we have one, we have i, we have i again, i squared, it's gonna be negative one. So really here, the only thing we can combine would be i and i, which is gonna be two i. So we're deducting two i, because this one and this negative one cancel out each other. This problem should look similar to the previous one. So if we have eight minus six i and we subtract 2i, these are like terms, so we could really say this is 8 minus 8i, and we're done. So take your time with foiling, take your time with box method, keep in mind these important facts here. As far as when we're solving for x in this case, we'll notice that if we try to move some terms to the same side, so if we move 5, using previous knowledge of moving terms to the same side. This is similar to when we used to factor and move all the terms to the same side. So we would have x squared plus two x plus five, and this equals zero. We'll notice that we can't necessarily factor this because five is prime and there's no sum of the products that will get us two. So the best thing we can do is use the quadratic formula, which is really utilized in this section. And that's featured on the front page. So you should have that there. So the quadratic formula allows us to solve trinomials and problems like this when we can't factor. So we're using the quadratic formula because factoring is not happening and we still wanna get some answer. So to do this, if we denote our coefficients, we have A, we have B, we have C. The quadratic formula states that our solution is x equals negative B plus or minus the square root, B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. 
Again, this is featured on the front of your outline. Instead of all of these terms, I'll plug in accordingly. So we now have negative two plus or minus the square root b squared, which is gonna be four minus four times one times c, which is five. And this is all over two a, so two times one is two. We can simplify our radical, keeping negative two plus or minus the square root now of four minus 20, which would be negative 16, where this is still over two. We see that we have this negative 16, so we can definitely factor out i. So we can rewrite this as negative two plus or minus the square root of 16 i, and this is all over two. Root 16, we can simplify further, just rewriting x equals so that I'm covering my ground. Root 16, we could rewrite as 4i. That's not a joke for anybody who has glasses. So we have 4i here, four times the imaginary number. We can rewrite this as two fractions if we want. Negative two over two plus or minus 4i over two. We can then rewrite this so that it's negative one plus or minus four over two, which is two, i comes along for the ride. So our two answers in this case, although they're odd ones, would be based around this. We could say that x equals negative one plus two i, or negative one minus two i, seen here. I'm going to include a cool little video in this description if you want to check it out that I found where it talks about how we can graph these out even though it's kind of odd. So it's as if we're trying to find points that are on the x-axis but we can't necessarily because they're imaginary so it's as if this kind of builds a third dimension which I think is kind of interesting.